All right, cool. Uh, hi, guys. Can you hear me? Anyone hear me? All right, great. Thanks, guys. Uh, since the pizzas are out, I guess the true believers are left, right? Since most of us here are here for the food. So, all right, guys. Uh, I'll try not to bore you guys too much. Uh, I have used the slide deck before for another event, so please ignore the TikTok tech emerging thing in the background. All right. So today we'll be talking about databases. Uh, talking about MySQL in particular, but uh, this talk generally applies to other databases as well. Uh, before we talk, I want to get a sense of the audience. Uh, may I know how many of you guys have used a database before? Used? Good, most of you, very good. How many of you guys have used MySQL before? Uh, a few, Postgres? All right, more people. MongoDB? All right, cool, nice. Uh, it's a good crowd when I see the people who use MongoDB to be less than <laughs> MySQL. No shade on MongoDB though. All right, cool. All right, so talk about, when you talk about a database, right, uh, what exactly is a database if you deconstruct it, right? So when you talk about databases, we just think about SQL, right? We think about you creating tables, sending queries, etc. But at its core, a database basically composes of a few components. Uh, first off, there's some interface. It'll be nor or some query language, normally, or some API. So most of the times, a lot of databases support SQL, right? And some databases may support APIs like MongoDB, for example. Uh, normally, you will use this API to perform queries, right? And when you give these queries to a database, the first thing that happens is uh, there's something called a query processor. The query processor's job is to take your query and kind of deconstruct it into an execution plan, into something that it needs to do with its storage. So it'll parse your query, create a syntax tree, and transform that syntax tree into some execution plan. So it knows how to process it. And under the hood, under the hood, the bottom layer, there are some storage components in the database. So there'll be the actual storage, like some files that are actually storing all your records. There'll be some metadata. There will also be some indexes, uh, maybe if you guys had set indexes. So roughly, that's how databases work. And this is not true for MySQL, it's true for almost every goddamn database out there. All right, this is it's usually this, this kind of architecture. All right, uh, I forgot to introduce myself. Oops, sorry, my name is Omar. Uh, I, while I'm giving this talk about databases, I work in the wallet team. You guys can imagine that as wallet uh, and money, we care a lot about data in our databases because data in our databases is literally money. So uh, we care a lot about database, databases and making sure they work correctly and work performantly. That's why we care. That's why uh, I'm quite passionate about databases and distributed databases. All right. So coming back to databases, right? Normal, generally speaking, there's two very broad kind of and very opposite directions of databases. And it's very important to be able to distinguish these two types because the kind of solution you develop for any problem uh, normally will fit into these two broad categories. One is OLTP. OLTP means you're updating one or two, a few small number of records and you want these updates to be very fast, right? So examples could be like a one transaction. I'm transferring money to someone. That's, that's just one single transaction, right? Or it could be someone modeling something like Facebook where I'm uploading a post or TikTok where I'm uploading a new video, for example, right? Like these are actions that I want it to be fast, small amount of, small amount of data. The focus is on speed and, and a small number of individual records. This kind of thing is called OLTP, all right? And there's databases that are kind of very specialized in OLTP, so MySQL, Postgres. These are the guys that are specialized for OLTP. We also have some databases that are called OLAP. OLAP means you're gonna scan a ton of data, a huge amount of data, and you're gonna do some very complex query on it. So for example, I want to analyze all the records of all the user events. So all the user interactions that happened in the last 24 hours, and I wanna group it by users in Singapore between the age of 18 and 20 who came to this Friday hex, right? For example, right? So if I wanna do this kind of query, it's a fairly complex query and to scan a lot of records uh, to do this kind of query and there's a fair amount of joins involved. Uh, this is a very different use case from scanning, from like operating on single records. So this kind of use case is called OLAP and there are dedicated databases for this kind of use case. 
So it's very important to understand what your use case is so you can just choose the right story solution for it. Uh, give you guys an example right, of this. So one very important decision that a database designer or database uh, user needs to make is whether you use a row-based store or a column-based store. All right. So normally, when you have a database, you c so it, the difference is how you lay out the data, right? So for example, I may have a table like this where I am. Let's say I'm Shopee and I'm storing date. I'm storing like product and sale information and some date information with it. So I have three columns: date, product, sale, right? Uh, so I can choose to use to store it. I put the rows together. So one record, I store the columns in that row together, right? So what? So I will store like my first record. I'll store the first column, second column, third column for the first record, right? So that my first record, then my second record, third record, makes sense. It's logical, right? That's one way to store it. Uh, another way to store it is. I could instead take the columns out, right? And I can just store all the columns together instead. So I can store the dates together, all the products together, product name, and all the sale information together. Anyone want to guess uh, what are the trade-offs? Like, which, why would, why would one be better than the other? Anyone want to take a guess? Like, or why would this make a difference at all? Any guesses? So when you need to retrieve several fields of a record yeah. at one time, then row storage is better. Exactly. Exactly. That's absolutely right. So for and usually for OLTP use cases, that's often the case because we want to extract several f columns together because usually you want to operate on the row at a few rows together, right? So you're right, absolutely right. And kind of anyone can guess why why where the column one might shine? Any guesses? Yeah, sure. So if you were selecting like only name and you don't need other stuff, that's one place where it shines. There's actually one other very strong reason to use a columnar store if you're doing a very, very large number of scans. So like if you're doing the OLAP system, there's one beautiful optimization you can get from using uh, columnar store. Anyone want to guess what that optimization might be? Any guesses? Aggregation. How's uh, what? Aggregation. Aggregation is more of a, like how you process later on, right? It doesn't actually matter. You can do it in both. Like it doesn't depend that much on columnar or not. But there's an optimization you can do. I'll give you guys a clue. The clue is imagine you're storing timestamps or dates, right? If you're storing dates or timestamps in a column, what's the advantage? Compression. Right? Exactly compression. Because timestamps have a natural like so it's like once it's like okay. 2020, like first of Jan, first of Jan, first of Jan, first of Jan, second of Jan, second of Jan, second of Jan. Easy to compress, right? Simply do some run length, run length encoding, or any simple compression scheme. You can compress that data, make it so much smaller, right? And that makes it much faster to scan through. That's one advantage, right? There's another optimization that some columnar databases would also do. For example, I'm not sure if you guys have heard of ClickHouse. Anyone heard of ClickHouse here? Uh, ClickHouse, if you guys don't know about it, if you ever heard here OLAP, you should use ClickHouse, right? Because ClickHouse is a very powerful OLAP database. In ByteDance, we use it a lot for almost everything OLAP. Uh, uh, also, we also use it prior to joining ByteDance a lot. Uh, one of the optimizations these guys do is they take this columnar stuff and they put it on steroids. So they will use, uh, I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with vectorized instructions. So your CPU, right, actually, Usually, when you think of CPU instructions, you think of fetching byte by byte. Like you fetch maybe 64-bit in, in 64, right? You say, let's say you're doing a sum of two numbers. You're going to fetch those num two numbers one by one, right? Normally, that's how instructions go. There are these instructions in your CPU that you might not know about called SIMD instructions, signal instruction multiple data. These instructions carry maybe 512 bytes or 1024 bytes. They carry a huge number of data in one instruction. And it's as fast as a single instruction on one int. What this means is you can do vector operations at the same speed. So you can do things much, much faster. Usually maybe 50 times or 100 times faster. 
ClickHouse does a lot of this thing. This trick is called vectorization. If you ever go into high performance computing or you join an HFT firm, they also do the same thing a lot as well. So vectorization is a good way to get very high amount of performance and uh, OLAP systems will do this a lot, basically. So this is why columnar makes more sense because columnar lets you do things like this because it's vectors, right? You can do vector operations. All right, so that's like, so okay, that's a little bit about that. Uh, in this talk, I'll focus a bit more on relational models because SQL. Uh, however, I just want to highlight that for data bases, there are many, many different models and different models have you know different use cases. So there's key value stores. Key value stores uh, are very good and they're very abstract. Uh, and like Redis, for example, is a very popular KV store. And also graph databases uh, that were quite big back in the day. They're still big in some places. If you want to do some kind of uh, like friends graph and do some graph operations, graph database is a good choice. Those are document object databases like MongoDB, et cetera, which are quite good. Okay, arguable, arguable, but they're still good. And the reason I, the reason I look shit, shit on Mongo is because uh, Mongo is very, is very popular. Uh, it became very popular until people realized that they need transactions. And then Mongo doesn't have transactions. They kind of half baked them in by having a transaction within one document. That's a long story. We'll talk a lot, about, a lot more about transactions later. Uh, we also have some other databases called white column family databases. I've used some of these before. So for example, Cassandra. You guys familiar with Cassandra? It's basically KV, but you get sorted. You get ordering as well. And then there's also vector databases if you're doing AI stuff. It's quite hot these days, especially if you want to do some kind of similarity search. Uh, it's good for machine learning applications. All right. I won't talk too much about database. So you guys have used databases before. You guys know what a table is. I'm, I'm going to skip through this stuff. Uh, you guys know what a primary key is, right? I'm going to skip through this as well. Foreign keys, you guys understand. Uh, this is all basic stuff. So so let's let's go to the fun stuff. All right, so then we'll talk about MySQL and InnoDB. So InnoDB, if you guys have not heard of it, is the database engine in MySQL. Why does MySQL have an engine? Well, it turns out MySQL is not actually a database. MySQL is more like a protocol. It, it kind of, it's kind of, a, it's kind of, it's a car, but then the engine doesn't actually, it lets you replace the engine. So you can have your, you can bring your own engine if you want. Uh, so InnoDB is the most kind of, is a default engine since MySQL 5.5, uh, which is a long time ago. Uh, it's very good. It's very performant. It used to be my ISM before. So InnoDB is uh, written in C++. C++? Yeah. All right. So what does a storage engine do, right? What, uh, so storage engine's job inside MySQL is to keep track of the storage. And that storage means there are certain in-memory and disk data structures that the storage engine will keep track for you to make sure when you save data, when you do some query, it can work correctly. It's basically the meat of the database, all right? Uh, there's, roughly speaking, a, a broad divide so there will be some in-memory data structures and there will be some disk data structures. We'll talk a bit more about this soon. Uh, before we talk about that though, it's very kind of important to understand in a database perspective, uh, what is cheap to access and what is expensive to access and how much space you can put inside it. So the fastest thing inside your computer to access it from the storage is your CPU registers. Right, followed by your CPU caches, L1, L2, L3, DRAM, uh, and then it'll be SSD, HDD, and network storage. Usually the faster things are volatile, means if you switch the power off, it'll go away. And non-volatile storage tends to become more expensive. One very important and crucial difference is for non-volatile storage, usually they can be sequentially accessed normally, or other, you access them by blocks. I'll talk more about this later. Whereas volatile storage, usually you can address them randomly. Uh, that means you don't have to pay that much performance cost. Talk more about this. This is a very famous chart. I'm not sure if you guys have seen this before. If you haven't, please memorize this. Uh, it will be useful in your interviews. Right, so how fast, how fast is a cache reference, right? So if, let's take the nanoseconds out and let's compare it to human time because it's a bit more something we can perceive, right? So if a L1 cache reference is one second, L2 cache reference is four seconds. All right, so L2 a lot slower than L1, 
right? L2 is also bigger. Uh, DRAM, which we normally think is quite fast, DRAM is 100 seconds, 100 times slower, two orders of magnitude slower. This is why if you ever go into a high frequency trading firm, the questions and the things they're optimizing for is to move things from here to here. So they're trying to find ways to actually not use RAM, but to put things inside cache as much as you can. So you try to get that 100x speed up because to them, the nanoseconds matter a lot. So, so and or if you're building some very high performance application, this, this matters a lot. But even then, DRAM is not so bad compared to SSD because if once L1 cache is one second, SSD is four hours. So SSD is super slow. Right? You think SSD is fast, it's, it's damn slow. And hard drive HDD is like 3.3 weeks, right? So it's damn slow, it's orders of magnitude slow, all right? And network storage, can forget about it, it's like one and a half year. So the point for bringing this up is your bottleneck is the storage. For a database system, the bottleneck always is the storage. It's not compute, all right? So generally speaking, especially for non-volatile storage, Random access is much, much slower compared to sequential access. The reason for this is you think about how a disk drive works, right? It is rotated its head. Uh, there's some mechanical components. So doing that operation randomly for random addresses is very, very slow. So usually for database algorithms, their main focus is to avoid randomization. They will try to optimize the sequentiality because Sequential writes is quite fast, actually, or sequential reads is quite fast. If you guys, have you guys heard of Kafka? Have you heard of Kafka? Yeah. Right. What is Kafka? Anyone wants to tell me? What's Kafka? A message queue. Yeah, that's great. It's a message queue. Uh, so the main reason, so I'm not sure if you guys know, but Kafka is quite good. It's quite high throughput. The main reason it's high throughput, the main reason Kafka is very good at writes is because it also makes use of this. Because in Kafka, writes are sequential. So it basically what it does is, it all, have new writes come in, it'll write to death this sequentially. So it's fast, it's pretty fast. Even on, even on an HDD, it's fast enough, right? As long as you avoid random writes, you can get pretty good performance with sequential, sequential writes, even with a slower, slower medium, right? All right, uh, you, okay, so let's talk about another, another concept. So when you, whenever you talk about disk, right, or any kind of non-volatile storage, you will not be addressing bytes. So you won't say, oh, I want to address byte at this address on this disk. That's usually not how it works. If you look at the OS APIs uh, for uh, write, writing to read and write to disk, like for example, if you guys, I'm not sure if you guys, have you guys done any uh, C, C work where you call syscalls directly, but normally for file system, you have this read and write APIs. You give them a file descriptor, you give them some address, right? And you give them probably the buffer of what, where to read, where to write. Uh, Normally under the hood, because the way these systems integrate in the, with the hardware, they are dealing with pages. So normally whenever you do even one byte write, it'll actually write a full page. The definition and size of a page usually varies, but most of the time in the hardware, it'll be four kilobytes. So normally when you're dealing with your disk, uh, it'll be four, you'll be writing four kilobytes at a time. Right? So even you write one byte, it's gonna, you're gonna write four kilobytes. Uh, on the OS layer also, there is a concept of a page, and normally OS pages are also four kilobytes, unless you enable uh, this optimization called huge pages or something, I forgot the name, uh, that can make this larger. For databases, it depends, uh, but usually as well, they also have a concept of a page. The size will vary. Uh, so for MySQL, they use 16 kilobyte pages, for example. Uh, so a page in a database, uh, we'll talk more about this, but basically a page in a database is kind of an abstraction around paging because we want to make sure that we control when the paging happens. A question that people might ask here is why do databases need to do this? Because, hey, the OS is doing it, right? Like, why not let the OS do it? Because if you guys study virtual memory and you guys might have studied like, uh, uh, like the OS also is doing paging, right? And the OS is also writing the disk. Yeah, okay, I can just use the OS APIs. So why do databases need to do this? Anyone want to take a guess? Why, why would databases like spend so much time and energy into doing very complex stuff with pages and trying to make sure they can optimize this part? Any, anyone want to guess? Because yeah. yeah, the database management system has more insight in the access pattern. Yeah, that's correct. 
You're absolutely right. So basically, you're absolutely right. Basically, because the OS does not know shit. Because the OS cannot predict how you're going to use the page. Whereas the database kind of knows. So one of the optimizations, for example, the database can do is, I can, if I know I'm going to read a bunch of rows from the same pages, I can preload them, right? I can preload them beforehand. So I don't need to pay the penalty when I read it. I can kind of put it in memory beforehand. It's a good, it's a neat trick. It's called preloading, right? So it's, uh, databases can do these kind of tricks to optimize because they know the use case better. So this is true generally. So generally speaking, systems that are more general tend to perform worse compared to systems that are specific. All right. Uh, inside a database, we have this thing. We have diff some different kinds of pages. So we have a page directory that will keep track of what the pages are. Uh, we'll, and we'll keep track of some metadata about the pages. And it'll also keep track of like how many slots are in the page, whether the pages are empty or not. And normally, when in a database page, there will be two parts of data. One is called the header, one is the data. So the header contains some metadata about the page, like oh, how, uh, the version, the page size, the checksum. Checksum is needed. Anyone want to guess why there's a checksum here? Like, why would you want a checksum? Bitrot is one reason, yeah. Bitrot is one reason. So you know gamma radiation, right? So if you leave some your disk outside in the sun for like a few years later, come back, your bytes will not be the same. You will have issues. And uh, uh, database corruption, data corruption is very real. Like you lose power, for example, or something you didn't manage to write correctly. It can cause problems like this. So checksum is there to kind of make sure the data you wrote is correct, right? There are also things around uh, transaction visibility, compression, etc. cetera. Uh, so I have a question, I have like an open design question for you guys. Like, let's say now I have this kind of layout and I can put tuples of data inside this, right? So let's say I have some tuple of data that I'm gonna to store together. I'm gonna to store some, row, it's a row oriented structure, right? So I'm gonna store some records here, right? How sh should I do it, right? Like, like how, how should I organize my storage inside this page? Like what's a good way? Such that I can get performant read, I can read queries easily, and I can do updates, I can do deletes easily. So I need to be able to read it, I need to be able to add new records easily, I also need to be able to delete records easily. So how, how would you lay out your uh, records inside? Wanna get? Row by row. Row by row, so one row by one row, right? One row by one row is great, so your row by row is great. How do you, what happens when you delete? You'll have gaps, right? Oh. So how will you deal with that? It's, it's okay. It's not a wrong design. It's, it's okay. Just that you have gaps, right? So uh, as the, if your record is the same size, it's okay. Because then you can fit another one. In, in, like someone else inside to fill the gap, right? It's, it's just that in that design, you need to assume that all the records are the same size. It works fine if they are. But if they're not, then you'll have these gaps. So the occupancy wouldn't be that good. Anyone has any other designs? All right, I'll share what I'll share what these guys do normally. So they have this design called a slot array. So they kind of have a pointer. So they'll have these pointers in front, a bunch of like pointers that are pointing to the actual slots. So the pointers go in front, and then the actual data goes at the bottom. This way, we can get more variable length tuples together. We don't have gaps this way. So so and if you want to remove something, you can remove it. It's fine and remove its slot. Uh, it's a little bit more. E it's a little bit easier to manage. It's a smart, smart design. All right. There still be holes. There would, there would be, there would be, there would still be holes. There, there would still be holes. So it's just that uh, deletions become easier, uh, but there would definitely would still be holes. Yeah. All right. Uh, so okay, another question. Uh, another point. So so. Uh, like I mentioned, right, so our databases, the key point is we want to keep things in memory as much as possible. So these pages, right, normally they'll be on disk. The whole point of database is to have some kind of cache for the pages. And the more pages are met, fetched from cache, the faster your database is going to be. So MySQL, NODB, has this massive buffer pool. If you ever s run a MySQL server at home or at, in your, on your laptop or on your server, uh, if you notice, it's very memory hungry. 
I, it'll take 90% of your server, server's memory and it will never give it up. And it's because it has to, it has to, because it needs it for this buffer pool. It's trying to keep things <coughs> as much as it can in memory. Uh, and normally what will happen is every time it accesses a page, like it'll fetch it from this, it'll be in this LRU cache. Uh, this is the specific LRU cache implementation they use. They'll insert stuff in the middle. They have some stuff to manage the lifetime of the pages. I won't go through it in too much detail. All right, uh, let's talk about B plus trees. So in MySQL, we also have this concept of indexes, indices, right? So, uh, and the reason why we need indices is because we want to be able to search things fast. Right? So we want to be able to go through a bunch of, a bunch of pages and uh, want to organize them in a way where we can do searches through a sorted structure fast. The assumption is that stuff is sorted, all right? So uh, if you guys done your algorithms class, you would know, you know, one very popular data structure is a binary tree, right? Binary trees are pretty good. Binary tree are, binary are really, really good. Any reason why we would not choose to use a binary tree? Like, like what's the problem with the binary tree? Uh, if we kind of think of it from, a, based on what we know so far about sequential disks and, you know, mem memory caching and whatnot, like, why would a binary tree not be a good choice? So we have balance. Uh, you can use balanced binary tree, right? Mm -hmm. like you can get balance it. So, so that's, not a, that's not a big problem. Yeah. The reads jump over the place. Exactly. Uh, yes. Basically, yes. Exactly. The reads, it's about sequentiality. Because there's two parts, remember. We have to avoid random, random, address, random addressing as much as possible. And a binary tree, it's very easy for nodes to jump all over the place because you only have two children. What's a B plus tree? B plus tree is a generalization of binary tree. Instead of having two nodes as children, you can have a thousand, one thousand nodes as children, or five hundred twelve nodes as children. They are stored contiguously in one page, which just happens to match the disk block size page as well, right? So it's just nice, very nice abstraction. This is a simplified version, so I only have three. So this is not what it really looks like. In reality, this will be a lot more inside, but it's it's really nice because the height is not going to be that big. It's going to be uh, uh, two power, ter ter normally will be whatever the size of the block is. Uh, so the how a B plus tree works, basically if I want to find uh, node number one, I'll go search to, search to the nodes, I'll go through one by one. So one is less than five, so I'll go to the left child here. Okay, I found one, I'm done. Inside each node there will be, uh, there's a key, which identifies the ordering. There's also some value, uh, which maybe, there's certain things we can store in the value. But roughly speaking, that's how B plus trees work. B plus trees have more complicated balancing. So normally, if you add new nodes and you're full, you need to do a split, for example. Or if you delete stuff, you need to do a merge back. It's a bit more complicated than a normal B tree. But B plus tree is a very powerful data structure. It's not only used in databases, actually. So you can also use it for any other sorted uh, requirement. For example, uh, we used it in my previous company. We used an in-memory B plus tree for doing uh, kind of, we wanted to maintain a very large sorted structure in memory and our sorting criteria was kind of fucked up. So we had to build our own in-memory storage, for example, and we use a B plus tree for it, for example. It's, a, it's pretty good. It's, it's a very powerful data structure for this kind of stuff. All right. Uh, okay, what, what should you store inside? So I mentioned this key and value, right? So what is the value you can store? I mean, you have two options, roughly. One option is you can store it IDs, and the ID points to the actual record somewhere else. Uh, that's the option preferred by Postgres. Uh, it's like stores a pointer to the actual index. Uh, another way is you can actually store the actual content. So if it's a primary key index, you store the actual content. If it's a secondary index, you store the ID. That's the option supported by MySQL. So the trade-off here is this is gonna be faster for primary key lookups. Uh, this one is not going to be faster, it's going to be roughly the same, so it depends. Uh, MySQL is quite good at reads, just FYI. Uh, but there's trade-offs, right? All right, uh, now the most interesting part, so transactions. This is why uh, this part is interesting because it's quite complicated. Actually, this is, if you understand this part, you will have a much healthy respect for uh, any database that claims its asset. Right, so, so what is asset? Guys, have you heard of asset before? Anyone? 
Oh, good, 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 good. It's not, it's not the drug. Don't worry. So, uh, so acid means uh, atomicity, consistency, isolation, durability. Uh, what does this actually mean? Uh, actually, the ones that make more sense are atomicity makes more sense. Atomicity means if you're doing a bunch of rides together, either all of them succeed or none of them succeed. Very powerful guarantee. And it's very hard to get it right. Because uh, consistency you can kind of ignore. It doesn't actually have a very strong meaning. It is rumored that they added it just to make the sound good. Like actually, you don't really, it doesn't have much of a meaning. But actually, say, all it's saying is, yeah, after you read after you write, then you get what you wrote. You get, you get what you wrote. Uh, isolation is something we'll talk more about. It's a very fascinating topic. And it basically means that concurrent transactions shouldn't impact each other. It's very hard to get this right. And durability means you store everything to disk. This is actually also, it may sound easy, but actually it's quite hard to get it right, especially if you have a crash in the middle of a transaction. So uh, I'll focus more on isolation actually in this talk. Uh, all right, so isolation has this thing called isolation levels. I was asking a guy just now over here, I was asking you just now, right? So, because uh, he was telling me they have to running some uh, SQL queries and they're slow. I was asking what isolation level you're running at, because this actually determines your performance to quite a large degree. So, uh, isolation actually levels kind of control how much your transaction is impacted by other transactions. And there's certain kind of phenomena that can happen. And if you're okay with those bugs, maybe you can get higher performance. But the cost is correctness, right? So let's talk about a few of these bugs. Uh, we're gonna take an example. So let's say I have a banking application, right? So I have A and B. They both have $1,000. In their account in their accounts all right okay and I'm gonna transfer uh, a hundred a transaction one will transfer hundred bucks from a and add it to B all right so here's transaction one I do a begin and commit right begin I do a deduct hundred and B will append we will add hundred all right easy and in transaction two I will basically take what they have in their accounts and give them some interest of 6%. So also quite easy, right? So that sounds easy, two different transactions. Let's see what can happen, what can go wrong. So what are the possible outcomes we can run if we run these two transactions concurrently? Uh, there's actually many, many possibilities. Okay, great, great, great. Okay, great, congrats. Thank you, thank you, thank you. All right, so come back. Uh, so for this game, we need to make sure that money does not, is not created out of the fly, right? So in our, in our world, uh, the total amount of money should be equal to 21, 2,120, which is 2,000 multiplied by 6%, because that's, you know, that's the total amount of money in our system, based on what we described so far. If any, ordering of this does not follow this constraint, it, we, have, we have money lost, actually. actually we have an incident, right? Actually it's a big buck, and it'll cause someone to lose their job, right? So we don't, we don't want that. Okay, so what's the easiest way to do it? Well, the easiest way to do it, I can just run the two transactions one after another, right? So simply ser serialize them in, so you literally serialize them one after another. 
So I can do this, I can do this one first, and then I can do this one, right? And I'll get this result, which is A and B will have different, different values, but the sum is fine. Or I can do the interest one first, and then I can do the, I can do the transfer. It also works. They have different values, once again. It's okay, but the sum is correct. So this, both of these are correct. It's not wrong, both these are correct. Uh, but it's really good, but it's slow. It's, it's slow because during this time, I'm doing nothing, right? So, so I, I'm, I'm just hanging. Uh, I could have done more things. After all, my processor has many cores. I'm wasting, wasting some throughput there, but it's good. Uh, and actually some databases do this. So if you heard of, has heard of Redis, anyone heard of Redis? Right, who's used Redis before? A few people, all right, okay, cool. Uh, usually when you start working, uh, you almost always use Redis because normally uh, if you have very high, high load, you don't want to expose your database to it. So Redis is quite popular for caching. Uh, Redis is very high performance and Redis, the key thing they do is they actually do this all the time. Actually Redis is single threaded. So Redis will, Redis is really fast because everything is in memory, but actually they're single threaded. It's good, it makes things simple. Uh, so they don't have to worry about locking and all this stuff. The bad news is because it's single threaded, uh, if you have a bad Redis query, you can block everyone else. So that can cause a big issue. Uh, it happened before many times. Uh, okay, so this is good. Can we do better? So here's another interleaving, right? So here's what we did. So what we did is, what we do is, okay, we do the operation A first in transaction one. So we do the deduction on A, and then we start the second transaction, we do the multiplication on A, and then we do the transaction, then we commit, we do the operation on B, then we commit, then we do the operation on B, then we commit. So in this case, the results again, the result is different, but actually our constraints are met. This is actually okay. We kind of locked A, we did the operation on A first, then we did the operation on B. This is fine. Uh, this case is okay. Let me show you a case that's not okay, just for reference. So this case is not okay. So here, I did the operation on A, right? So I... I did my, I deducted 100 from A, so A is now nine, 900. Then I did the multiplication to multiply, and then I did the multiplication on B, right? And then I commit this transaction, and then I, then I do the change to B. So in this case, my constraint is broken. So this is an example of uh, what we call a dirty read. To be more precise, What's happening here, the wrong thing that happened here, so, so R of A means read, and W of A means write, okay? So, more abstractly, if you think about it, if I'm doing a read of A and a write of A in my transaction, so if I write to A, and then I start another, another transaction, and I read this value, right? It's okay, but if I abort the transaction later on, right, I need to roll back everything but this guy committed. So now I wrote, I read a, a, what's called a dirty value of A. I, I read the wrong value. So I read, if I read an uncommitted value of, from another transaction, this is called a dirty read. And this is the first of the, the, the four annoying uh, transaction problems. So uh, the dirty read uh, is something you always, almost always wanna avoid. Uh, and normally, the weakest, at least, uh, like, if, so if you don't have, if you're not using, if you're using something that does not give you asset at all, like, so if you're using Redis or MongoDB, you'll have this problem all the time because you don't have transactions, right? So you can't really guarantee. You'll always run into this kind of problem. All right. Another phenomena that's slightly different is, let's say I write to A in one transaction, and then I write to A again, write to A in another transaction, and then I write, then I write to B in this transaction at the same time, I write to B in this transaction, and then I'll overwrite this, overwrite over here. I, I write to B again in this transaction. So this write will overwrite this write, right? <coughs> so this is an example where I might overwrite uncommitted data from another, another <coughs> transaction. So, so, uh, where, so, so this is called a dirty write. It's kind of similar, similar to a dirty read. 
so another kind of phenomena is called a non-repeatable read. This one is a bit interesting. It's, it's basically, uh, if I have some long running transaction, and I'm, let's say I'm reading A again multiple times, so instead of a loop, then I have another transaction that reads A and then writes A. So it, first A is 10, it's updated to 19. And then I get, I read A again at 19. So within one transaction, I got different values of A. This is another kind of edge case. Uh, and in some case, maybe it's okay. Maybe it's not. It depends on your use case. Uh, so this is called a repeat, repeatable, uh, non-repeatable read. It's a read-write kind of conflict. So how do I manage these things, right? So how do I protect against this kind of phenomenon? Because this can happen, right? Uh, the classic way is locks. Basically, I need to have a lock. So uh, the key idea here, the principle here is, before I do any rewrite operation on the variable, I need to have a lock on it. But if I have a lock on it, I can, I can, I can kind of control the ordering. So that way, I can guarantee it's safe. So if I have this kind of transaction where I'm doing with the reads and with the writes on A, what I'll first do is I'll lock. I'll get a lock on A. I'll do a bunch of transactions, bunch of my stuff. When I'm done with it, I'll unlock A. If another transaction it tries to lock A, the lock will be denied. It has to wait. It'll hang in there for a while until the lock is released. When the lock is released, then I can continue. So this makes it safe. So you need locks. Yeah, you have a question. Yes, it is. Package managers may do it. I'm not entirely sure. Unless they're doing some concurrent stuff, internally they might have some locking locks as well. Oh, right, right. Yes, yes, yes. You're right. Yeah, I know what you're referring to. Yes, yes, yes. You're right. They will create a little grab, a little have a file lock on it. You're right. You're right. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, DP, DPKG does, does it this way. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, quite, quite similar. All right. So, so that's the fundamental idea. The databases will have locks under, in, in, underneath. Uh, if you think about locks in, from a database perspective, they sound quite similar to uh, what you might have encountered in your OS class, like mutexes, you know, uh, semaphores, etc. Uh, it's, it's quite similar, but uh, slightly different in a database context. So when a database is talking about locks, they're referring to this logical concept of a lock, which is a database construct. Not the OS level lock, uh, which in the database world is called a latch, uh, which is used to protect against multiple threads. Because over here, it's not multiple threads you want to protect against, but different transactions. So a lock is a more kind of higher level construct. And normally, we'll have a lock manager inside the database to manage these locks. All right? All right it's a very important concept in storage systems. Uh, there's different kinds of locks. There's two basic types of locks, but uh, we have a concept of a shared lock. Shared lock means you can read, multiple people can read. You can't write to it, multiple, but multiple people can, multiple readers can read it. So two, if you have two shared locks, they're compatible. I can, I can get a shared lock, I can get a shared lock, we both can read, that's fine. It's not a problem. X lock means exclusive lock. It's only meant, only one person can write. No one else can do anything with it. So. This is a compatibility matrix, so S lock to S lock is compatible. X lock is not compatible with anything else. So this is a very, very basic lock type, and it's a fundamental lock type in MySQL, in any database, actually. So another kind of point is, just because you have locks does not make it safe, or does not make it correct. I can have a case like this where I have a transaction where I read, I, I read and write A, and I grab a lock around it, then I read and write another transaction, right? And then I still grab a lock around it. And then I read, lock, then, I, then I do some operation, I read it again. This read is actually, a, is actually a dirty read because I'm reading uncommitted value. So just because I put locks around my stuff does not make it correct, actually. I need to be smart around how I do locking. I cannot just put locks around and job done. I actually have to be careful to make sh to to organize my locks in a way to make sure it's correct, I need the protocol to manage my locks correctly. It's actually not that easy. Uh, so one protocol that does this well is called uh, two two phase locking, two PL. It's a protocol that databases use internally on how to manage locks. Uh, I'll slide on that later on. Okay, I missed that slide. Anyways, but basically what it does is it has a growing phase. Initially, it'll try to grab all the locks it needs, and then later it'll have a release phase where it'll release the locks. So that's about locks. 
There's also this thing called a deadlock. A deadlock is when I have two locks waiting for each other, then they're stuck, basically. So this, you might have, might have seen this error before, maybe. So here's an example where, for example, I, get, I put a lock on A, it's an exclusive lock, and then I start another transaction where I have a lock on B, I do a read on B, uh, then I do try to get a lock on A, right? So I'm stuck here. And then uh, well this, so, so, so basically, wait, let me think, sorry, let me try to remember this one. Uh, yeah, basically, basically, if I in this transaction I'm trying to grab a lock on B, but this transaction, but 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 uh, so so I'm uh, both transactions are waiting for each other because they're they're both waiting for each other's locks to release. So, uh, so basically, the way to guard against this kind of thing is uh, a lock. Uh, a deadlock basically is a, is a cycle. If you gen gen generalize it, it's a it's a cycle in a graph. Normally. The way you graph, uh, the way databases resolve this will be they'll create this thing called a wait for graph. So they'll create a graph of the dependencies. If a dependency have a cycle, that means it's got a deadlock. So that's how they'll, and that's how they can det detect these, and they'll give you an error saying deadlock, and then they'll try to break break it. All right. Uh, one of the, like one final concept is this concept of lock granularity. So a lock. You can get a lock on every single row of the database. You could do that, and you can do that, and that makes sense. But if you're doing like a scan or some update to one million rows, that's very inefficient, right? It doesn't make sense to get a lock on every single row and get a million locks. That's very inefficient. So normally databases have this thing called lock hierarchies. They'll have these different layers of locks. So they can, so they, they can be smarter on how they apply locks. So you can have a lock on the whole database, or a lock on the table, or a lock on the page, or a lock on the tuple, right? So, or even a lock on the attribute if you really want performance. So, and uh, the actually, if you look at it, so there's many other kinds of locks as well I didn't talk about. Uh, there's intention locks that actually kind of uh, are kind of unmaterialized locks. I won't talk about it too much, but just to share this compatibility matrix, this is what a real database compatibility matrix looks like. There's a lot more kind of locks. And this is not the full picture. There's actually many, many more as well. Uh, so one of the last part, the last kind of uh, phenomena that we didn't talk about is all the stuff we talked about so far, dirty reads, non-repeatable reads, dirty writes, these are all fine. Uh, however, there's one more phenomena which is called phantoms. Phantom reads or phantom writes happen when you have inserts, when your new data comes in. Because it's new data, you can't grab a lock on it because it's new, right? So you, there's no way you can know it exists beforehand. So you can't lock it beforehand. So uh, this requires slightly more different tricks to handle. Uh, the general concept of how to handle this is to add what's called an index lock. So if you want to insert some entry between this and this, I'll put a lock on, between that area. So one of the ways we do it is called a gap lock. So if I want to insert a 15 here, I'll put a gap lock here to make sure I don't get any more entries here. Uh, the reason why this is very relevant, so this, I have a funny story about this, is uh, we... So if you have a new entry in a database, right, and uh, let's say you want this to be very fast, one problem that can happen is if you un unintentionally grab a grab a, a gap lock, because it, it, it may have to grab a gap lock. So so if it grabs a gap lock, gap locks can be very expensive because it's a gap lock. It's a gap lock of the whole gap, and if that may cause all your new writes, if your writes are all coming in ordered, it might cause all your writes to freeze, for example. It may cause your database queries to become very slow. So I have to be very careful about this kind of thing. All right, so finally, isolation levels. So isolation levels are this. Serializable means you get none of these problems. It's the safest thing. It's also the slowest thing. So normally, I, don't, I mean, if you're a bank, you probably use it. I don't know anyone else who runs with this, actually. Repeatable reads is where phantoms can happen. So you can have repeatable reads. We know what repeatable reads are now. Uh, read committed means... Basically, fan, fan, uh, wait, repeatable reads means phantoms can happen, no, repeatable reads won't happen. Uh, and non-repeatable reads won't happen, sorry. Read committed means phantoms and non-repeatable repeatable reads can happen. So the only guarantee you have is you don't get dirty reads, dirty writes. Everything else can happen. And read, read committed is you're basically unsafe. So normally in, uh, in my company, we run at read committed, so, uh, which is good enough for most cases. It depends on your tolerance. So back to my question, or the question like, so check your 
your DBA with your isolation level. If you choose, choose RC, there's a chance you might get a performance, performance boost, maybe, if your use case can afford it. All right, so that's all. Uh, that's all I got today. Do you guys have any questions? Has any guys already had dinner? So this is not exactly correct. Yes. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, right, it's a good question. So uh, if, for example, you don't care about asset, right? Like, so in a cache, for example, if you're using a simple KV store, uh, and I don't care that much, and I just want performance. Because the thing is, this get more safety, this also gets slower. It also, is it, so if you want f things to be fast, uh, read, un read uncommitted is, maybe it's okay, right? It's okay for you to read something that's out of date. So in that case, for usually it's for performance reasons. So. And uh, like the nice situation where it could be used? Right, so we use it, for example, like uh, uh, we use it all the time if we wanna, for so normally when you're building any system, you'll have, to, you'll have a cache layer. The cache layer and the database are completely separate systems, right? So if you're reading from the cache, it's always uncommitted, right? Because it's got nothing to do with the database transaction. You'll always have these dirty reads, dirty write phenomena if you read from a cache. Because it's not, there's no locking happening that's preventing you, right? So any system with a cache that's external and doesn't have any kind of uh, locks, distributed locks with the database is a uncommitted. So And normally we use caches all the time, right? So that's a very common example of reading uncommitted data. Yes. So phantom is a phenomena that is to do with n new writes. So basically, a phantoms happen when you are unable to put a lock on something because it's a, it's a new it's, a, it's some new insert. So I'll give you an example. Uh, so let's say I I let's say I have a transaction where. I want to grab the person, the oldest person in the room, right? Whose status is lit, right? So, so, and let's say the oldest person right now is 72, right? And that's fine, I can start a transaction. And then someone else comes in uh, who's older than this, right? And let's say, let's say in this, so, so, so in this, and let's say we, we commit this transaction, now the problem is that if I'm doing something with this value, I, I, will get, I will get wrong result, right? Because now this, this status has changed. Now this is the oldest person, right? Or this is the oldest. So my, my basically something else, I had a criteria, and this constraint was broken by a new record, basically. So this is an example of phantom. If I don't handle this, I will have some anomalies in behavior, right? So, so that's call the phantom, phantom read, phantom write, etc. The way to guard against it is you'll put, if you'd want this kind of read, you might want to put a index lock. So if, if you insert someone who's older than this, it'll be blocked. So this insert will be blocked until this transaction commits. So that's how you can guard against this. So you've been kind of using some kind of index locking. So that's, that's a phantom. Non-repeatable read is when you can read some value and have different values for it within one transaction. So it's a slightly different case where I modify this thing and then I commit this transaction. Now I read it again, it has a different value. So one example where this is relevant is let's say taking a snapshot of a snapshot, right? A snapshot is a long running process. I take my snapshot and some of the stuff, while I'm taking the snapshot, some of the stuff changes. So if I'm building an accounting system and then after a snapshot I wanna get, an, I wanna do a sum of all the accounts. I will get wrong value. I actually won't get a consistent value, right? Let's say in my current system, I want to make sure all the money adds up to zero, right? All the all the tra all the debits and the credits should add up to zero. And I do a snapshot of this whole thing while I'm allowing st other stuff to happen. So I will, if I allow repeatable reads, what will happen is at the end of the day, my my transaction will not add up because those other transactions would have over overwritten the data. And this is an example of a problem caused due to non-repeatable read. Would that make sense? Oh, yes. Go ahead. I'm curious, like, what's the big difference between ISAN and InnoDB that made MySQL switch to InnoDB? Uh, I think mainly it's performance. 
So uh, MongoDB performance is quite good, and it implements all this stuff quite well. So my SM had some performance problems. I think that's the that's the main reason why. Not. Yeah. Yes. How does database ensure durability, especially in a ah. distributed context? Oh, okay. That's a very complex question, but even in a single node setup, actually, it's not that simple. Basic thing you got to do is you got to f-sync, right? So f-sync, if you guys don't know what f-sync is, f-sync basically means you force sync to your disk and your file system to write, right? Uh, the question is how, sh how do you do this and how do you guard against crashes? Because let's say you crash while you're doing it. Now how you recover, it's quite, it can get quite complicated. The general, the, the, the very kind of high level principle is databases have this thing called a log. So it's a, a, a bin log. You might have heard of a thing called bin log or write ahead log. So normally most databases will have this thing called write ahead log. Before they make any changes to their buffers, they will write to the write ahead log first. The reason is if they crash, they can always recover from the write ahead log. That's the general principle. In a distributed system, this becomes way more complicated because distributed systems are fun. So you have different nodes and they may have different ideas of what's going on. And so in a distributed system, normally, depending on what kind of distributed system it is, if it's a strongly consistent distributed system, you might need some kind of consensus mechanism. So you might need something like Raft or Paxos to have a majority of nodes agree on what the truth is, uh, and then you commit that. So, so you'll have some consensus algorithm to do that. And examples of this would be things like TiDB, CockroachDB, et cetera. MySQL does not support this. So uh, yeah, the, uh, the other way is you don't do it. So actually that's what, kind of what we do. So we actually, we, we don't rely on distributed database to provide us uh, cross shard transactions. What we do instead is we do heavy sharding. So each shard is completely independent. So it's actually not a distributed database in a classic way. Uh, so the way kind of so, so, so the way like we do it in 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 Bydance and also actually how YouTube does it originally is uh, what we do is we take you take individual MySQL. MySQL is pretty good. The biggest problem with MySQL is it doesn't have sharding built in. So you can do application there sharding. Actually, that's what happened in Shopee. They did application there sharding. Instead, what you can do is you can build a proxy on top. So you can do some kind of sharding in the proxy. So that proxy does sharding for you, and that proxy will rewrite your query to give you sharding. But you only deal with one database, and you don't support cross-database transactions or cross-table transactions. Just doing this actually gives you a fairly good distributed database that is good enough as long as you don't need cross-shard transactions. Actually, that's what we do. So we use that. If you need cross-shard transactions, we'll do them in application layer. So that's another way to manage this, and it's quite high performance. The yeah. flip side is you don't have cross shot transactions. One more question. Yeah. If, uh, if a server goes down, yes. how do we ensure availability of the database? Right. So you need high. You need multiple instances, right? So the only way to get availability in a distributed system is you need more replicas. So normally you'll always run with. So like so you at least you'll have three replicas. So whenever we run uh, we run MySQL, we'll always have one master, two slaves, at least maybe more. Normally, not only that, we'll put the slaves in different data centers to make sure that, you know, stuff doesn't happen. Uh, fun fact, it's like, like we've had outages, many outages before, where we had a fun outage once where we had a MySQL master and slave on the same physical host. So the physical host went down, we lost the master and slave together. And the funny thing there, and we also lost the HA mechanism as well, so we didn't do a failover also. So it was kind of funny. We couldn't have rights for like 20, 30 minutes. So this kind of stuff happens. Uh, availability is quite hard. You would, basic idea is you need replicas. <coughs> and then you can switch traffic over that uh, fast, quickly, when a fatal failure happens. Cool. Yes, any last question before we end? Okay. I guess that's all then. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you.